I V M. There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people, and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey, where you can fill out the survey. Does shaming and criticizing motivate children? How can we stop ourselves from criticizing our kids? Is there a better way to motivate them? Join me, Meghna and Devi Shobha for this episode of The Big Talk About Tiny Humans as we decode the effect of shaming on children and how best to enhance their inner motivation. Almost every job in the world requires training, except parenting. You need to learn parenting on the job and that can be really hard. Here on Big Talk About Tiny Humans, We want to help you navigate the world of parenting better and make your lives a little bit easier. Hi, I'm Meghna. And hi, I'm Devi Shobha. Every week, we bring you the best research on parenting. Top tips from experts. And actionable strategies to confront the numerous challenges that all parents and educators face. So let's get started, shall we? As a parent, it's easy to slip into shaming your child. It can happen so easily as you blurt out what you're thinking. Do you really want to go out looking like that? Why can't you get good grades like your sister? Why are you crying? It's not that bad. As we blurt out such things, we usually don't think of them as shaming. We think of them as something that might help our child recognize the problem and, you know, maybe motivate them to change. But shaming and criticizing does not motivate our kids. In today's episode of The Big Talk About Tiny Humans, your hosts, Devi Shobha and I, discuss motivating our children without shaming them. Hi Shobha, how are you doing? Hey Meghna, I am doing good and uh, I hope you're doing well too and thank you for bringing up this topic because this is something that is very close to my heart and I'll tell you why through the episode. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, this is so important, so relevant and this is so omnipresent (laughs) like you said it's not even it's not even recognizable yeah and like you actually use the right words it's like so easy to slip into that mode Mm. yeah I also think Shobha it's very ingrained in us like this is how mostly our parents spoke to us right (laughs) but and and (laughs) and that's why we don't recognize it as shaming and criticizing so I really want to ask you what does shaming and criticizing really look like And how can we stop ourselves from, well, shaming and criticizing our kids, especially when it's so ingrained in us? Yeah. So first of all, I would like to, you know, emphasize uh, or explain what shame feels like, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, Shame is this, you know, uh, sensation, uncomfortable sensation that we feel sometimes in the pit of the stomach. Sometimes you feel us, you know, you're hearing something. You know, even if you look at yourself, you're hearing something that you don't want to hear. You yourself are feeling bad enough about it and Hmm. you still hear about it. And the only thing you don't want at this point, don't want more of is somebody else looking at you and judging you, right? And shame is the exact sensation that you feel when you feel judged and you feel like you cannot escape this gaze of others, this ambit of judgment right mm. and uh, you have nowhere to go you you have nowhere to hide and shame is the feeling of having let down not just the person you know shaming you but also yourself because ultimately it leads to low self esteem a disillusioned sense of self and it also has the effect of um, hazing your your sense of purpose because suddenly you don't know what you want and what you have done. And sometimes you feel that it's a big mismatch. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of external pointers coming at you rather than giving space for internal motivators to come up and, you know, clear up the space for you. So that is what shaming is all about. And like you rightly said, criticism, there is constructive criticism and uh, there is correction and correction very closely relates to constructive criticism and uh, shaming is a very thin line which parents don't realize when they cross it right so um, like you said you gave some very good examples in fact I would like to share a very heartbreaking incident that has happened just yesterday 
Hmm. One of my daughter's classmates actually killed herself. Oh my uh, god! Yeah, and she's just thirteen. And, oh my god! And uh, nobody knows, of course, that the the reasons are not very clear. But clearly, I mean, it's not very hard to trace it to you know feelings of low self esteem. And hmm. she's apparently she's been asking for uh, ninth grade right now that hmm. the exams are coming back on uh, offline. Mm-hmm. And apparently, she's been trying to ask her. parents and her teachers to allow her to do the online exam hmm. but obviously uh, she heard some harsh words i don't know from whom i don't know what hurt her but apparently she tried twice and she succeeded the second time and you know this is exactly the thing that we don't realize you don't know when you are slipping into the red zone right hmm. and uh, apparently what happens like last week i attended uh, my child's ptm right mm. and i saw like you know a classroom full of parents sitting you know the teacher was distributing the the papers the pre board papers and uh, she was discussing the grades individually with each of these mm-hmm. children and the parent and apparently there's one guy who walked in very i mean a 10th grade boy and with the mm. mask and everything and his mom he walks in with his mom and uh, the teacher is like you know what you have to postpone writing your exam this time no reasons given and she i mean the teacher and the mom actually kind of you know ganged up against the boy oh my god i i know that you know parents mean the best they have the best intentions and i cannot say that teachers don't have the best intentions in their hearts but the thing is you know sometimes we forget the fact that delivery is everything your intentions don't matter your delivery is sometimes everything because children and science also says that adolescents right they are so much more sensitive to criticism than adults because their brains are in the second phase of neural development like their brains are just like a toddler's brain their prefrontal cortex is just developing mm. and the way they process all this information is like they internalize it so much and it comes out in the form of defiant behavior because now they are no more toddlers they cannot coddle they cannot really be that transparent with their emotions because they're not that encouraged anymore and uh, they don't know how to vent it and that's what comes out in the form of defiance right so shaming and criticism can look like this shaming can look like you know i am so disappointed in you i am so i didn't think you would do this i expected more out of you you know all of these forms and i i could see that i mean i felt embarrassed sitting in that classroom mm-hmm. because i just wanted to reach out to the boy and say you know what it's all right You I know, know. You this is not the end it. of the world exactly yes. you will it's figure amazing. it out it's amazing yeah 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 so i i just wanted to tell him that and i i just wanted it to stop and believe me megna this is so common i hate going to ptms because i just see this all the time it's like ptms are like a complaint session about the child a That's hell hole for the kids i guess yeah why i mean there are so many have you recognized the effort they have put in in coping with their social uh, isolation how much of emotional yeah. effort they have put in but we always talk about you know they have not done this in science they have not done that in math i mean yeah. i think we will have to move away from this kind of you know a tunnel vision and look at learn to look at things holistically because really that is what yeah. childhood is about and you know even living a life because ultimately what is it that we're teaching our kids right yeah right no that i agree i think our words can make or break and i think i'm really shocked and stunned and saddened to hear about your daughter's classmate and uh, let's take a break right now but we will come back and we will talk about why it's important that we stop shaming and criticizing our kids hey everybody it's been another great week on the ivm podcast network On the Habit Coach, Ashton talks to the founder of Radiance Clinic, Dr. Falguni Shah. She shares three must-do things for healthy and glowing skin. On the longest constitution, Priya delves into the state-wise regulation of trade, sale, and consumption of alcohol. On Terde Mere Raste, Kesho describes the serene 100-kilometer journey between Leh and the Lamayaru Monastery. On Smarter with Sis, Siddharth shares three lessons we can learn from Hajima Isayama, the creator of the superhit anime show Attack on Titans. And on all things policy, the Takshashila folk observe humanitarian corridors and their existence in times of war, both in the current and historical contexts. 
Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Also, don't forget to rate us on any of the platforms you might be listening to us on. And do check us out on YouTube. We're building a whole bunch of different channels. You can find them on ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube. And we're also doing a small listener survey, which we would really appreciate your help with. It helps us kind of talk to advertisers. So you could go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It'll just take a couple of minutes and it would be really Really, really helpful to us. We do appreciate this. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, SBI Life Insurance and the India Water Portal. Thank you so much for making this possible. Welcome back. We were talking about the impact of shaming and criticizing our kids. And I would really like to know, Shobha, why is it important that we stop shaming and criticizing our kids if we really want to motivate them? Because it looks like to us as parents that when we want to motivate our children, You know, (laughs) criticizing them, comparing them, shaming them is the way to go. Right. Um, So the most important reason uh, to really stop criticizing is because you don't want to lose your child. Whether you lose them, um, you know, emotionally or otherwise, you you are actually keeping at stake something much more, much bigger than what you're betting on, right? So this is big enough reason to stop shaming and learn to, to, to you know, give constructive criticism because I'm not saying that it is uh, parents have to accept whatever is going on with their children because uh, as, as children are growing up and not just children, I think every adult, every human being, as we are living our lives because life gets gets complicated we do human things right and it's not necessary that you have to accept everything but there is a way and I think it's extremely important that we learn to deliver our criticism in the right spirit and in the right way especially especially Mm. to adolescents of course adolescence is still more accepted because people understand that you have to talk in a certain way with you know teenagers but I'm saying that this is more, this is just as important, even with very young children, the way you speak with them, they end up internalizing that voice, internalizing that, that kind of judgment. And every time they are in a situation like that, when they are adults, the same voice plays in their head, they keep judging themselves. And this is reason for us to learn to, you know, give constructive feedback and not really, really take care not to slip into that shaming zone. And it's really hard. It's really hard, yeah. like you said. It's hard because lots of parents don't know how to do it because they have not seen it. Like teachers shame uh, children in the classrooms. Mm. Parents shame their children. We have all seen it. We don't have good examples. It's we, so normal, exactly. right? It's so normal. Yeah, it's normalized, it's, right? It's hard yeah. because we don't have good examples, right? So it's like... You have to learn mm. it. It's a learn. It's a skill to be learned all over. You know, uh, afresh. And mm. uh, it's like uh, you don't have good examples, so you have to construct the habit by yourself. But it needs to be done. It's that mm. important. So, so Shobha, that makes sense, right? You said that uh, we need to stop shaming, and that is really a learned skill. But do you think there's a better way of changing our child's behavior? Do you think there's a better way of motivating our kids definitely i think one of the what can be better than getting the child to want to do it for themselves right so that is what is called uh, in scientific terms as intrinsic motivation right now what we do when we uh, what we try to do at least when we shame and criticize our children is to you know sometimes push them into thinking that there are better things, better people out there and you really want to do better, right? So that is something that we do and it might work in a few cases, but not all the time, Mm. right? And uh, what works all the time is really helping the child to find that spark in themselves, that kind of uh, the, the confidence in themselves and the reason to do something. So unless a person, be it a child or an adult, a person is truly convinced of the value of something, you're not really motivated to to do something, at least not for a long time. So you might do it for a short time and then you kind of drop off because suddenly now you see that it doesn't meet your purpose or your vision and you kind of drop off, 
right? But when you have a clear vision, when you have a clear purpose, and you have chalked out why you want to do what you're doing, then I think it's much easier to sustain that kind of motivation, and that is what as parents and educators and adults of influence over this period of childhood. I think that is what we need to understand and really internalize and really help children build that sense of purpose. And then motivating them is really not such a big deal because it only requires us to fine tune their work, their strategy to somehow achieve it, right? Now you don't have the problem of motivation. You have a problem of strategy and something else, maybe some tools, techniques, that is okay. But the motivation problem, so you don't have to slip into shaming because now you know and the child and anybody involved knows that already the best is being done, right? So now what else have you to look at? So that's what you will think about. So once you get that out of the way, you can look at other things. You know, it's interesting as you were talking, I was thinking about the one basic motivation that, you know, is a concern for most children and parents. And that is, you know, the motivation to be able to study, you know, the intrinsic motivation, that sense of purpose that you were referring to, Shobha. And Mm. do you think, it's very interesting, I was thinking, do you think children today are struggling with inner motivation? Because they are so used to instant gratification. Everything is instantly available at their fingertips. You know, if we had to find out, if we had to do a research project, you know, we would look up uh, an encyclopedia, we would go to libraries, we would interview people, we would do all of these things, right? But I've noticed that many children are today trying to solve their problems just by typing away with Google search, finding a shortcut, you know, using the latest app, instead of, you know, a well thought out plan, instead of, you know what I'm saying? So do you think, do you think this, today's generation, um, because everything is available at the click of a mouse or press of a button, do you think today's generation of children are struggling with inner motivation? Uh, I really like that question, Meghna. Uh, But before I answer uh, that question, I would like to, you know, bring up a research uh, study by uh, social psychologist Dan Ariely. And he had done the study in his university where he actually had a bunch of children, right? A bunch of high school children shred, like he had a shredder in his Mm. office. And all he had to do was, you know, he arranged for a bunch of high school children to come on over and just shred that piece of Mm. paper, you know, for every piece of paper, they were paid something, okay? And uh, people were just doing it. Now, there was no motivation. I mean, there was no sense of purpose behind it. Now, what happened was, after a while, he actually had them draw something, like build something, and then he shredded, Mm. right? Now, when he did that, so in the first instance, Children were happily doing it, no problem. They were earning money. And, uh, you know, some people did it more, some people did it less. And that was okay. Now, when he actually brought a sense of purpose, like their work, right, and asked them to shred it, it was like completely destroyed, right, within minutes of their building it. So, again, they were paid the same amount. They were paid the, in fact, they were paid higher. But children stopped doing it. Why? Because they understood the kind of effort that went into it, Mm. right? That is what we say. And there's there's also a story, right, that we, I I grew up listening. Um, There's this, well, there's this uh, woodcutter who, you know, gives uh, one rupee to his child every day. And uh, the child, and then the I think the, the father says, go and put it in the well. And he happily goes and puts it in the well every day, one rupee in the well every day. And then one day he says, I don't have any money. Now you go and earn it. And he cuts wood the whole day. And then he brings the one rupee. And he says, now go and put it into the well. Mm. So now he won't. Now he doesn't right. want to because now he hesitates. Right. It's the same thing, right? right? It's the same Dan thing. Dan Erily, so, like, are you talking about the author of Predictably Irrational? Oh, yes. I've read that book. It's an amazing The upside of irrationality. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes, yes. Predictably irrational, upside of irrationality mm. and all of these, the, the research on irrational uh, behavior. So this is it, right? So what does it tell us? It basically tells us that we need to see to it that our children's efforts come to the fore, yeah. right? Now when, so I think the answer lies in the design of the challenge. To me, yeah. at least when I think about mm. it, 
when i think about it you give them very dumb very unstimulating projects and uh, you know uh, say <laughs> that you know you just have to present it uh, then obviously you know you, children and adults Even, i mean don't uh, we find the easy correct, way out yeah. we find the easy way out right so that's what happens so when you actually take the time and the effort to design a challenge that taps into their potential then why will children do it yeah right why will children why will children really uh, be happy with you know turning in a, a very boring because children want to do interesting stuff yeah. right so i think that is at the root of the problem is what i think i think that's a beautiful so, um, story and a research study and uh, it it answers my question about you know if if we give yes. if we design tasks that are inherently uh, boring and uh, not engaging enough and i think unfortunately yeah. that's what a lot of our education system does right if you look at yes, the kind of yeah. assignments and homeworks and you know yeah. stuff that kids get it's not really helping them apply themselves right yeah. which is what i think is the root of the problem and if we solve this then we have solved the problem of motivation beautiful yeah beautiful <laughs> so okay so uh, i know that there are a lot of people parents out there and even us as we were growing up we were given praise bribes rewards right hmm. to uh, you know the fact that i'm getting an a plus or i'm getting a 90% in uh, my project or in my exam is supposed to motivate me right but do you think that's really the kind of inner motivation that you're talking about in effect why is helping a child develop inner motivation more important than external motivation we can always you know give them a reward you know if you top your class that's what my parents did if you top your class which i did we will buy you this which they did so why do you think mm-hmm. that's not a very smart design okay right. so first of all i don't want to go right out and say that it's not very smart because one of the things that helps in deciding your motivation is to basically understand your purpose right for example a external motivation external reward is might not be a good idea if you simply say that you get good grades and i will buy you something that you want mm. okay or i'll buy you something that is very very coveted you know not by you but by your peer group and then you can you know probably have it also now there is a problem in this connection when you when you just say that you do it for me mm. okay and i give you something mm. then it is a pure transaction but mm. if you actually connect this external reward to some internal sense of purpose or question that they can answer for themselves then i think external reward can be a good thing i can give you an mm-hmm. example for example my daughter she is very interested in music production now she wanted something called the midi board which i have no clue about okay what is that it's called the midi board um it's it's no but what is it <laughs> it's a small keyboard kind of a thing that has a lot of uh, settings for music production it works when connected to a software oh and uh, you, you know basically it like helps them create different kinds of music and rhythms and things like that so okay. yeah so i didn't know what it was so but she wanted it so what did we do we said okay we can buy it for you but we won't buy it for you just because you top the class or something we i really want to see that you are interested so i want to see 6 months of consistent work okay on okay. something that you think is important you think you decide okay but every day i want two hours of work logged into that purpose okay if i see that for 6 months so i am not connecting it to my goal i am connecting it to your goal okay i mm. want to see i want to make sure that you are truly interested and not wasting my money right so i want to see that if you are really interested and i see that you have put in 6 months of work then i am convinced that you are really interested and you really want to pursue it then i'll buy it so that's what we did and she did it and you know so what happened during the course of that time is that the 6 months she got to actually interrogate introspect and finally arrive at an answer for herself as to why this is important for her right mm. why is this important in the first place why is the midi board serving my purpose what role does it play and can i do without it so it teaches resourcefulness 
it teaches consistency it teaches them to you know uh, the, the art of introspection and i think this is what we should do i think we miss the point by saying that you do something for me i give you this that's not what works hmm external rewards okay. work when you find a way to connect it with their what's important to them so that's what matters in the end so um, like i said i really think external rewards are not to be completely uh, black painted yeah completely yes <laughs> they work in fact there's a very famous steve jobs story that uh, uh, steve jobs when he was a student he used to you know work on math problems and his teacher because he was a uh, he was not a, he was not such a great student but his teacher actually <laughs> paid him uh, $2 after school to solve a bunch of problems and he did that only for those $2 and mm. after a while he got so good at them that he didn't mind when he didn't get those $2 so it can work you know uh, you know so that's right. that's a very famous story so like this is a this is a great example where external motivation works but what did she do she again found a way to connect him with his potential right mm. so that uh, so that's not like uh, that's not like a pure transaction right so I think that is No, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I think when what my parents did as well, right? Yeah. When they promised me something at the end of the year for topping the class, I'd always wondered why it would motivate me whereas all the studies in psychology are saying that, you know, external motivations are not really longer lasting. And now I realize this because I was able to throughout that academic year, year after year, you know, come to value my academics i started enjoying studying and that is why i could even top if i could not have topped if it was only a carom board that was being promised to me at the end of the year if i had not genuinely enjoyed studying so i guess what you're saying makes sense yeah. uh, connected to what works for me connected to my sense of purpose connected to something that you know might be a hidden potential something that i even might end up enjoying fair enough yeah so that brings me to my next question right yeah. which is what we're basically here to talk about today how can we develop our children's inner motivation how do we get to that sweet spot where we are you know helping them find their sense of purpose where we are you know helping them stay through something which is effortful even if it is long and arduous how do we do that yeah right so megna i think uh, um, i have uh, you know i would actually put this into a five step uh, process i call it the quest okay uh, and i'll and i'll i'll actually explain it to you so mm-hmm. one is q q uh, u e s t so q mm-hmm. is for actually question behaviors right mm-hmm. so this method right it was actually published in the journal of consumer psychology and uh, this is a psychological trick that uh, is designed to quicken or speed up the individual's readiness for change now what is motivation right the motivation is basically to be willing to change some behavior or something in your life to be able to meet a goal or a purpose right be it short term or long term it depends on the goal but it definitely requires change that is why you need that motivation that potential energy right to you know overcome the inertia so this trick is basically to just help the individual understand why this is important but we won't actually ask a very direct question so for example if you want to you know help your child study or you are noticing they are that uh, you know she is not been waking up early and she is actually promised to wake up early but she is not right so now instead of shaming her instead of saying that you know you you said you will wake up but you've never doing it you always do this you always do that instead of that what you can do is you know you can just say are you going to be waking up tomorrow or are you going to be you know waking up at the same time all week or when do you intend to wake up you know as we had planned so what happens when you ask such a question without actually instigating somebody to defend themselves mm. is that it triggers them to think about their behavior and feel a little bit of discomfort because <laughs> motivation requires for us to be not happy with our current state only then you will do something mm. that is desirable so how do you make them not make them not be happy about what they are doing not us we whether we are happy or not doesn't matter they have to be unhappy about what they are doing 
So, but this you know, is, yeah. but you know, I, I, it, this makes so much sense. Right. But you know what? We sabotage this process right. by actually asking this question or framing our questions in a sarcastic tone by nagging. Huh. You know, when we nag or when we are sarcastic or when we criticize, hmm. then we become the bad guy, right. and that completely eliminates the onus or of our on our children to feel right. bad about what they're doing. This makes so much sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's why it's very important to frame the questions properly. It should only be designed to trigger a little bit of discomfort and get them to start thinking about, you know, their behavior. Because motivation, like, you know, some, some there is one very beautiful saying, and I think it's so important. Motivation runs out and we need it every single day, right? Mm. And it's it's so important for us to keep reminding. And if there's somebody else who can do it for us, like a parent as a safe space, right? Uh, mm. like a parent or an educator who you know believes in you i think that is something that can take them a long way right mm. so this question this framing of the question so you know for example um, there is like are you going to are you going to set aside some time for that uh, language program that we had decided okay are you going to be planning for that summer internship are you going to be planning for uh, the music classes that you had promised you know so when you when you just say this over and over again mm. not not like lag and nagging or shaming or mm. you know criticizing but just kind of reminding that in a, in a tone that tells them that you know i'm here to help you and i i remember what you wanted you might have forgotten but i'm here to remind you and this is something that you should pursue so do this right so this mm. is this is called a question behavior effect okay. and this really induces that little bit of discomfort and drives change so this is mm. the first thing so the quest the q in the quest stands for this right mm. and then so this is the first step right and then u u is when they start to feel unsettled now they're going to be moving away from something that they're very comfortable with uh, you know in their comfort zone now they have to move into their zone of discomfort so now mm. they're unsettling right mm. now when they're unsettling what do they need right when they are unsettling they need a little bit of help with structuring with a little bit of help with their time with their schedule so what happens you see what happens with at least with my daughter is that uh, she always asks me uh, during my, her exam preparation she always asks me to you know put down help her put down a timetable for herself study timetable mm. and invariably mm. she will not follow to it i'm sure i i even when i'm doing that that sounds familiar <laughs> <laughs> even when i'm doing it i know that so mm. like two days three days down the road she'll come and say amma you know what i have completely gone uh, way off my timetable now will you help me revamp my timetable <laughs> <laughs> so basically what she means is that now i have to fit in whatever she has missed into the time available so mm. this goes on and on so it's not like so here the important thing is her intention to make it work is there right now what she needs is a little bit of help from me in restructuring so what happens when you actually put down that structure for them is that it gives them a kind of a strategy a that they can a, okay. no a, something mm. that they can see that can come into their vision line of vision and they can see themselves finishing it so that boosts their confidence like you said right mm. so that is a boost of confidence and that is so important so that fine tuning that structuring that help with a little bit of tools and techniques that is when they are moving towards the unsettling phase so they really need that the other thing they need during this phase is empathy right mm. now why are they not able to do what they're doing for example yesterday i had a talk with my daughter and she was like you know what i'm trying but i'm not able to because of my health reason my daughter has a little bit of a problem with her skin condition and she is like you know what i'm trying my best i'm really not able to do it so it's like so the other thing that they really require when they're going through this unsettled phase is uh, a lot of empathy because now they are already going through a lot of discomfort they are already struggling to keep up with their goals and sometimes you lose the vision of your goal right so mm. it's really hard and just yesterday like i had a talk with my daughter and she was like you know what i am uh, i'm really facing a lot of uh, trouble keeping up with my my schedule because of these 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 reasons i uh, you know sometimes my health doesn't uh, cooperate sometimes i feel like sleeping more sometimes i just i'm just too tired i'm tired after school i just don't want to study sometimes my mood is off you know so 
yeah these are all human conditions and we will have to accept it and you know still empathize and listen and still say you know what i understand all of this but you still need to get this done right and <laughs> so that is what we are for right mm. we are we are there for so without shaming without criticizing we can still give them a way to remember their own goals and good reasons for them to continue what they were doing right so i think my mother you know used to be a great example for us because she never used to listen to all of our excuses you know we had a hundred odd excuses <laughs> uh she would listen to all of them and still say you know what is that important or do you think your excuses will stand or your your uh, goal will stand right so mm. or naturally you will you know with common sensical after you're fed and slept and then your brain starts working and then you say okay what now uh, okay <laughs> i need to get back you know so mm. it always works and uh, again uh, for teenagers like i said the the second um, brain growth phase happens in their adolescence and really that is the stage when they take all of these impulsive decisions and all that but they also require a lot of parental support empathy listening communication and uh, support they may look defiant they may look all self sufficient and all that but they really need a lot of our support so mm. this is e so empathy is very very important then s s is again strategy right so strategy is something like you know maybe you know or the child themselves knows that you know they don't do like doing something so in that case what do you do you probably put a very low frequency activity with a very high frequency activity sorry ahead of a very high frequency activity for example you say that you tell them that you know what we will decide not to open instagram for the next half an hour till you have finished this chapter right uh, okay. uh, and uh, you can give yourself you know a weekly set of tasks to do for example every friday from 2 to 3 pm this is what we will do this may may or may not be related to your studies but it could be related to your long term goal for example if they are researching on on uh, college admissions so from 2 to 3 pm i will sit with you every friday or every wednesday or every thursday whatever works and uh, I, you know we will do this together so this is a strategy and then mm. um basically uh you know finding and then there is also this research finding that says that if you're looking for a health goal right if you uh, keep something that you should not eat very close to you obviously you <laughs> you're bound to do it you're bound to do it right so what yeah. is a better strategy uh to keep it away like put it away from your eyes don't even i mean keep it away from your line of vision and you're not thinking of it that much mm. at least you right so that is something that this is a strategy that you can use even in your in a way in your uh, goals uh, in pursuing your goals and things like that when for example if there's a study goal then you say for about one hour i am not even going to be anywhere close to my computer or for one hour all of us go- are going to put away our phones and just going to concentrate on what needs to get done and then mm. after that so this is strategy right then and in the uh, the final thing is um you know make it time bound like really for 10 minutes a day right or 20 minutes a day just help them focus on one important task even if it is for 10 minutes a day just to get their motivation kick started for something that is not something that they will do on their own just you know help them get it started for example my daughter has a big big inertia towards math right so <laughs> what seriously she had a giant math phobia and uh, i don't know where she got it from but i had a hard time dealing with it so what we did was really break it down like really mm. break it down into small chunks like five or six problems and just yeah. do this right yeah. so it's yeah. not like she is going to have to start, you know uh, cross a mountain she just has to do this for the day yeah. that's it right so if you you know make it time bound and manageable i think then uh, it's very easily uh, doable and motivation is all about wanting to do it by yourself and that is what you want for your child i like the time bound step as well because um it seems to me and this is what i find myself telling my clients in therapy as well you know if you think a problem is big enough it only means you've not divided you've not made the first step small enough right 
right? So I think dividing it into smaller chunks and tackling each chunk at a time is not just a great strategy for motivation. It's a great strategy for concentration as well. Right. It helps you focus and, you know, if it's time bound, it right. will definitely be something that you'll be able to accomplish. So that that makes a lot of sense. Quest, right? right. Cue for question behaviors. Um, you for unsettled when you know you end up feeling unsettled because you're questioning your behaviors. E for empathy, S for strategy, and T for time bound. Right. That's a great mnemonic to remember. How do we, you know, end up motivating our children without shaming them and without criticizing them? Thank you so much, Shobha. I'm positive that our listeners will find this super helpful. And if you guys have any questions about quest or motivating your kids and developing and nurturing their inner motivation. And if you have any questions about how we can stop ourselves from shaming and criticizing our kids, because if it's ingrained in us, if that's what we grew up hearing, it can come on so automatically, right? Uh, so please write to us. You can write to uh, Shobha at, on her Insta handle uh, at Kids Kintha and to me at on my Insta handle at the therapist mommy. And, uh, we will we will answer all your questions and we will definitely find a way to uh, help you with all your parenting queries. Thank you so much. Bye. So that's our episode for today. Thank you for listening to Big Talk About Tiny Humans, our podcast for parents and educators. Hope you enjoyed it and don't forget to share it with your friends and family. Listen and subscribe to Big Talk About Tiny Humans on the IVM Podcasts app website, and all major audio platforms. We are available everywhere. You can follow us on social media and online. Meghna is at The Therapist Mommy on Instagram and YouTube. And you can check out her website, raisingfamilyacademy.com for a transformative course on raising a child with emotional intelligence. And Devi Shobha is at Kids Kintha on Twitter and Instagram. And check out kidskintha.com for in-depth articles and events on parenting and child development. While you're at it, do also check out other great shows from the IVM Podcasts Network at shows.ivmpodcasts.com and IVM is on social media at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We'll catch you again on our next episode. Don't you think that if everyone around you is getting smart, you better be smarter? Hey there, I'm the traveling professor Siddharth Deshmukh and I'm back with season 2 of my podcast to make you smarter. Smarter with Sid. What's this season's focus about? Well, it's about 10 minute nuggets that will make you stand out at work. It's time to go from smart to smarter. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday and become smarter with Sid. Suffer रास्ते मंजिल और मुकाम अक्सर ये हमसे कुछ कहना चाहते हैं पर हम हैं कि अपनी रोजमर्रा की जिंदगी में इन्हें सुनने से कतराते हैं नमस्ते दोस्तों मेरा नाम है केशव चतुर्वेदी और मैं आपको ले चलूंगा कुछ ऐसे सफर पर जहां आपको एक नया नजरिया मिलेगा सफर और मंजिलों को देखने का आइए इन किस्से कहानियों में डूब जाएं हर मंगलवार और शुक्रवार 